Hello, viewers, and welcome to the latest episode of The Huddle. It's a CEO special, and I'm with Tom Waterhouse, uh, Chief Investment Officer of Waterhouse VC. Tom, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it, it's a pleasure to have you on. And in this case, uh, for a specific reason that we've, we've, we've been doing CEO specials as a, as a regular feature for, for a few years, and in a couple of previous ones, you've come up via, via other stories. So when we've spoken to Sam Swanell, um, the points bet gang, or not gang, but um, yep. there's, there's been a lot, when we talk about Australia, Tom Waterhouse's name that comes up a lot. So it's a, it's a pleasure to have you on. And I think a great, great question for me to start with, hopefully a great question and leads to a great answer is um, you became a licensed bookmaker at, at 20. I think a perfect starting off point. Tell us, tell us how that went. <laughs> Look, um, I grew up in a family with a great grandfather who was a bookie in the 1800s and my Grandfather was a bookie in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. My dad was a, a bookie uh, also and and ran a pro and still runs a professional betting syndicate. So I'd grown up all around the industry. My grandfather was Australia's leading Group 1 trainer, and my mum is Australia's leading living Group 1 winning trainer. So lots of racing and bookmaking uh, heritage, but I didn't like it at all. And um, I was just at uni studying commerce, thought I would go into some something to do in finance, and then my dad said to me, look, do you want to work one day for me on a Saturday at the races? And I worked for him and I just fell in love with it. There mm -hmm. was so much money, uh, big betting. And my dad said to me, he goes, look, I think you should start out at the docks. He goes, because you won't have my form. You won't have the benefit of uh, of all the stuff that uh, my dad and my grandfather and, and that they have at the, at the horses. It'll be a bit tougher and it will be basically a good grounding for you to learn. And so I became a a bookie at the dogs uh, on a Saturday night and a Monday night, and then was a bookie at the provincial races and, and horse races. And then my grandfather came out of retirement at 80 and we formed a partnership together. And that was, uh, yeah, it was, it was incredible time to work with both with my dad and also my grandfather. It was, um, it was such a great learning experience and, and I just loved it. I still back, look back so fondly at the times just going to the races, with my, my dad and grandfather and, and, betting at the races it was a it was a really really fun time yeah um i mean my next question was going to be what was it like growing up in a in a racing family but it's it's striking to me that you say you didn't like it at first and then but then then you sort of fell in love with it what was it that growing up with it it, it didn't really appeal to you and then i guess what was it that then that changed so dramatically well my mum is and i think this is why she's been such such a success she's very strict and so mm -hmm. she used to from the age of when I was about 12 years of age, she would make me work at the stables uh, every Sunday and then at least a week every holidays and getting up at, I don't know, 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning and going to the stables and, and mucking out boxes and leading two big racehorse around a, um, a bull ring for a couple of hours and then riding trots out on the horses and then coming and mucking out the boxes and washing them. And, and I just thought, well, all my friends are going to the beach and going out at night and I'm going to the stables. I'm like, this, this isn't any good. And um, I didn't have this, the passion for the horse uh, training side of things. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't under, understand it. And then I just, I saw the racing, uh, the betting side of it and just fell in love. It just clicked. And um, you know, you can't, every, every kid's different in what they're passionate about. And, and I just, uh, I just love the betting side of things. And, and yeah, it's funny. I, I never wanted my parents to talk about horse. I'd say, Oh, stop talking odds and sods mm -hmm. and all this stuff. And now my mum says to my, when I'm with, over at their house, she says, please stop talking to your father <laughs> about betting. Please stop it. Um, it's so it's funny. Full how, circle. How things go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you, do you think maybe that um, you say, you say your mom was strict and made you work. Do you think that kind of, maybe you didn't, you didn't necessarily enjoy that. Like you say, a friend going to the beach, but then later on in life, do you think maybe that that influence from your from your mother has benefited you in terms of maybe just discipline and work rate that maybe is instilled in you that maybe you didn't even know that was there, but as a result of that that kind of experience? Yeah, I think I think discipline, working hard, they're key ingredients in anything you do, and and uh, it's not just my mum, my dad, my grandfather, my aunt, my sister. They're, they're all hard workers. Every every mm -hmm one in the family works hard and and you you've got to build that muscle whether it's in sport or, or whether it's in academics or in at work it you've got to work hard haven't you and and you've got to work smart but it, you've got to put in the time and the effort and you've got to learn it and part of 
life is just trying and showing up. And and she definitely, well, she, she my mum's for the last 40 years woken up at 2.05 every morning and nonstop work, work she's there. And same with my dad. He's up every morning at 3, 3.30 in the morning doing the form. So they're hard workers, but they love it. And if you love what you're doing also, it's it makes it a lot easier. Absolutely, yeah. Um, let's, let's let's go back to kind of your 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 racing journey, but um, a, a key step in your journey that TomWaterhouse.com. Um, can you talk us through that part of your story uh, and maybe anything that I've missed in between? If, if I have to fill in the gaps and uh, and, and, and yeah, what look, happened there. So my grandfather was the biggest bookie in the world in the '60s. He used to take million pound bets when you could buy one of the biggest houses in Sydney for three thousand pounds. So a mm. huge better, and he came back. And I was timid. I, I, I had in my head that for uh, small fish are sweet. I, I was like, oh, well, I want to be a small bookie and just win all the time. And he said, look, you've got to bet. You've got to gamble. And 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 he really, we were at complete opposites. Um, and he he really said, he goes, look, I've never seen, it's embarrassing the way you book make and told me I was an idiot and just would swear at me going home in the races. And, and look, he was right about nearly everything. Well, probably everything. And he transformed me into being a big bookmaker. And by 2008, I was the biggest bookie, you know, on course bookie in Australia and held more money in 2008 Spring Carnival than all the other bookies uh, on the rails in Melbourne and was holding about $6 million a day and thought, this is the life. I had my dad's form. I had access to Betfair where the bookies in New South Wales weren't allowed access to Betfair. And I had a lot of big punters to do with, the fact that I was betting big, but also the name. And, and we also had a, a bank coming on from my dad and my family coming from the family. I was mm -hmm. able to bet big. And so it was some really uh, ingredients that made me have an edge. And mm -hmm. I thought, well, I want to be doing this forever. It's like playing um, poker every day, but high stakes poker. And it was, it was just so fun. And, um, but then the advertising laws changed in Australia oh, no, and online bookies that were based in the Northern Territory uh, could suddenly advertise. And the turnover went, I held 500,000 cash, uh, got 500,000 cash out of the favourite on Derby Day 2008 and couldn't get 5,000 out of it in the favourite in 2009 Derby, being mm. a couple of rolls over the other bookies. And um, and that Stakes Day 2009 was the last day I worked at the races and I thought, well, I've got to go online mm -hmm. uh, to try and keep my customers. And... Um, we launched TomWaterhouse.com in 2009, 2010, and it grew dramatically. The, the name was known and we branded as an individual and we were able to grow our custom base from 100 customers to a quarter of a million in 18 months. We found out early that live sport and advertising on live sport worked, but we didn't have the scale to compete with the likes of Bet365, Ladbrokes, uh, Paddy Power, uh, in their marketing and tech. And so we realised we need to find a partner. And so we started the sale process in 2012. William Hill did a $700, sorry, $700 million acquisition, <laughs> a roll-up of Centibet Sporting Bet. And we were a, an add-on, a small add-on as part of that transaction in 2013. Mm -hmm. And then in 2014, they asked me to be the CEO of that business in Australia. And so that was a big transition, obviously, going from being a, on course bookie to start up online bookie to running a, a 500 person uh, multi brand um, part of their part of their business that we had our operation was in Australia Tel Aviv and Manila uh, and, and yeah I never never had a job before so to be running that company be CEO of their Australian business and go and report to their board and and basically see how these big organisations work and and was an amazing experience and and yeah very very grateful for having that period working with William Hill for four years. Um, uh, learned so much and and saw a different side of the advantages and the disadvantages. There's disadvantages and disadvantages uh, these big corporates mm -hmm. have. Yeah, um, when you when you look back at on course bookmaker and, and CEO of, of of the Australian business, you know what are the first things that come to your mind in terms of maybe striking differences? Um, obviously, the, the scale and the size is, is you know is is, is obvious. But in terms of your day to day, what were the main differences? So on course bookmaker or in running TomWaterhouse.com? Um, um, 
I mean, I, I guess I, either or really, but I, I guess the different stages in your in your journey, but probably yeah, the most comparable would be the the startup phase to then the so William I, Hill. Days. I think the startup phase it, it was a very uh, valuable learning experience to run William Hill Australia's business because when you go into one role in a, in a corporate, you can often get stuck in marketing for ten years or fifteen years or in the finance function for that period of time or trading. But in a in a startup, we TomWaterhouse.com started. You mentioned uh, Sam Swanell before. There was Sam, myself, and two other people, and and we sat those two other people on on the first week. And mm. my my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, she left uni and and, uh, and came down and helped us. Helped us, and we basically had to be jack of all trades. You see how all the different bits function, and you're going through a really fast track learning experience of understanding. Well, what are you going to do for marketing? What, what how, how does the trading function operate? How do you do all of the uh, payments and finance function? And it's uh, like it's just a, a different beast. So when you go to William Hill, where there's all these different parts, it's hard to find people in the organisation that understand all those bits that connect together because mm -hmm. they've become a specialist for 10, 15 years in one area. So coming from a startup background had a lot of advantages. Now. There's a lot of disadvantages in the startup in that you have amazing learnings and and uh, 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 Alpha Global Group being a big corporate. Like big corporates have some huge advantages with scale and talent and, and that a startup a startup doesn't have when it's just beginning. But it was a great experience and and um, I learned a lot from both and saw mm -hmm. that both had a lot of advantages and disadvantages. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you could, if you could pick one out in terms of which one you prefer, do you, do you have a, a clear preference? Well, my preference is definitely what I'm doing now in investing mm -hmm. in businesses and and finding businesses um, that I think have got a really good chance of success and and can navigate their way from startup to uh, to working with large corporates. I find that the most interesting because I feel I can mm -hmm. leverage off off the the skills off off both the both being a startup and being running a, a large corporate. But uh, I think there's different skill sets. The skill sets that you need to, to run a startup uh, are very different to running an organisation with 100 people to an organisation with 500 people. And I imagine uh, it's a completely different skill set. You need to run an organisation with 50,000 to 100,000 people. It's mm -hmm. it, it's And being able to, when you've got a small group of people that you know well, them understanding... Uh, your objectives and your priorities in the business is, is very easy because you can know how to communicate with them. When you've got a large organisation, being able to hold large groups accountable and be able to ca cascade those objectives and those priorities down to all the different people in the organisation so they're all accountable and they know that they are driving towards something and it's the same thing as the other people in the organisation takes a lot of work, mm -hmm. a lot of work and, and a lot of time and effort and Look, it's a, it's a real skill set, and uh, I, I I'm not. I I was on a learning process for four years. I got a lot wrong um, mm. in, in being CEO of William Hill Australia, uh, and realised that it's a big it's a big task. The bigger you get, the the harder that challenge is to keep a, an organisation really focused and and driving in in the same direction and and. Yeah, I take my hat off to people that run these huge organisations successfully. It's a it's a big task. Yeah, in twenty eighteen, um, William Hill Australia acquired by the Stars Group, and then you buy TomWaterhouse.com dot com back. Um, talk us through that that kind of that part of the journey, that that stage uh, in the career. Yeah, so look, I, I wasn't quite sure. I had TomWaterhouse dot com back, but I had a two year non compete, so I okay. um, I wasn't quite sure what to do because um, I'd sort of got used to being in corporate and, and lifestyle and, and being part of a company. And I thought, well, I can't go into betting and I hadn't done anything else. So I'd been in betting for 20 years. And, but I thought the interesting area is that William Hill and all of these corporates, they differentiate on marketing and they differentiate on product. And there was always a huge debate internally about which products got prior prioritized for tech build. And there was a whole bunch of third party suppliers trying to get into the William Hill or other corporates ecosystems, whether it was 
bet with mates functionality or cash out or an affiliate marketing tool or a data provider or an automation tool, whatever it was, it was first of all hard to get into the product pipeline, but secondly, hard, hard to prioritize to get it built. And I thought the investors, if you're an investor in William Hill or an investor in Paddy Power or Tabcorp, mm -hmm. I thought it was somewhat easy to analyze the value of those co companies in it. They're very similar lines of the PL. You've got turnover, gross win, cost of sales, marketing costs, headcount costs, uh, and so on down the PL. And then they, they all make a certain amount, and then you've got to pay your company tax and so on. And whether a company should be eight times earnings, 10 times earnings, 12 times earnings, well, you're making a judgment on the management team and you're making a judgment on how good their tech skills are and how good their marketing and what properties they've got. But I thought I didn't really have an edge, but I thought understanding the technology suppliers and whether they could get integrated or whether they were needed by the operators was an area that most analysts and people outside the industry couldn't understand. Mm. And it was much narrower who actually could understand whether these businesses were worth a lot or not or not worth much. And so I got a handful of the best developers that I've worked with um, over my time last 20 years and, and said to them, look, we're going to go and analyze all of the tech around the world and see what we basically try and work out what are the best suppliers and see if there's an opportunity and we can find deals at attractive valuations. And that was sort of the idea. And, and we started in August, 2019. And, and so for the last four and a bit or four and a half years, and that's what we've been doing and, and spend all our time, whether it's going to all the different conference game gambling conferences around the world or on uh, Zoom calls or going to meet them and, and just looking at tech businesses, supplies to the gambling industry and, and trying to find businesses that have significant upside. And, and we've found some really interesting business and had, uh, well, so far, thankfully, uh, a lot of success. You need a bit of mm -hmm. bit of luck to begin with, and we had a bit of luck to begin with and, yeah. and have carried that on. And, and um, once you have a bit of luck, it snowballs. And, um, and yeah, so basically I, my, my hope is that over the next 10, 20 years, I can just focus on that tech layer, um, tech supplies to the gambling industry and, and, and just invest in some really great, great businesses. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the investments you, you've made and, and are always on the lookout for, are there any particular success stories you, you can you can just discuss? And, and uh, in terms of potential investments, when you're looking for, for you know, that, that one that really catches your eye, um, what do you look for? Yeah, so we've had um, probably three deals that really stick out as being um, uh, big successes. Uh, we've, we're in a, a data, uh, odds data supplier, um, which was a listed business that um, was great for our, our investors and, and really was our first deal, gave us a blueprint of, of how to structure deals and what to really look for. Uh, then we were... Um, had a great success with a, a platform builder, a business that builds platforms, specifically platforms for people wanting to go into the, the crypto um, betting space. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we uh, also invested in a, a leading uh, tennis syndicate, um, a young guy that's uh, just one of the most talented people that I, I've worked with and, and set or seen work. And, and he's been able to build a model where he's got just a huge edge on tennis, uh, ex Tony Bloom and um, learned from, learned from the best and, and uh, uh, more best in, in soccer betting or football betting. And, and he just, uh, I think he's just got a, a huge opportunity to grow his, his business. And, and then we've, we're in probably a dozen or so really exciting businesses that I think have a huge, huge potential to be a success, you know, it's just the beginnings of us sort of of doing deals with them and 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 investing in them. But I think they've got a long runway. Um, mm -hmm. And I think for us, we just look for businesses that uh, really are fulfilling a need of the operators. You know, can they fulfill a need of the operator? Are they doing something unique? Uh, and do they have the ability to grow? Like we we look at businesses that are generating revenue. But can they go from being in one operator to 20 operators? And that's that's the question we ask. And if we think that's possible, then it's interesting for us. Mm -hmm. and, and naturally, uh, I imagine your experience, you know, on the operator side gives you that that extra insight in terms of what, what operators will need from the supplier. I think, yeah, I think it's it, it, not only what they'll need, but how likely are they are to succeed in getting into the product roadmap. You know, mm -hmm. it's a 
it's a very political, uh, uh, like there's a lot of pro competing priorities that the head of trading has a different need to the head of marketing. Yeah. And the finance director or the head of data and analytics has a different need to both those two people. You know, it's always it's always difficult and you've got competing priorities and competing things that have to get into the system. And so understanding that and navigating that, but also navigating what is going to have the biggest uplift in, in revenue for the operator ultimately leads to revenue for the supplier. You know, so mm -hmm. actually understanding how that works is, is really important. Sure. Um, this next question is a bit of a side note, really. And um, I don't know if if you you're in the kind of the same circles as as Matt Davy, but he's he's a guest to, of of the huddle a, a few times. And I just wondered if your journey was maybe a little comparable to his, because he was on the supplier side, a leading industry CEO, but but now also plays more of a role of of the investor. Yeah. Look, I, someone with Matt's experience and and his team, you're dealing with the very top notch people in the industry. You know, like. Uh, I I haven't I, obviously I, I've known Matt for a long period of time and followed his career closely and we were sort of parallel time of uh, William Hill's involvement with his business but his team of people I've worked closely with um, for four years at William Hill and and he's assembled not only himself which he's got amazing talent and skills and and been such a success but the group of people and the talent he surrounded himself with. Oh, well, they're they're top notch, and mm -hmm. and I think when you're in the industry for a period of time, you you want to attract talent. I feel that the the team that I work with uh, trying to attract the best people that you've worked with over twenty years in the industry, and you have that benefit of seeing a lot of people, you know, and and you know that industry well, and and I feel he's done done the same, surrounded himself with talent. And they've done some really great deals also. You know, it's um, they have, I think both of us have a unique edge of understanding multiple parts of the industry. And and it's, uh, yeah, there's not many people with that background and that experience. Mm -hmm. It's been fascinating to to talk about your your, your career and, and learn so far. Um, I've got a couple of quick fire questions. And then I, I always like to end by, by looking ahead to the future. Um, What's the best thing about being uh, a CEO and obviously at the moment chief investment officer, but throughout your career, what's what's the if you could single out the, the, the very best thing? Oh, it's just business is so fun, you know. Like it's it's just so fun. It's the best game in the world, isn't it? Like you you I'm I'm not really I don't play golf or I don't know mm. go like running or go and play football and stuff. It's just it's just it's just great fun. It's great to see like businesses growing, help them like strategize of how um, things are going to play out over time and, and and work with great people, talented people. And the thing I like so much about what we're doing now is that when you have your own business or you're running a business, you're on a real journey and, and it's such focus, but you don't get to see lots of different things where being in the business that we're in now, investing in lots of different businesses, you see so much different talent you, it, the calls, even the business we don't go into, and we've missed some really great deals. We've, we've had some really great deals, but we've missed great deals. Mm -hmm. But you get to speak to amazing talent every day because just because we don't invest in these businesses or like a particular business, it's just not the right fit for us. You know, it's but there's still such talented people that are having a go. You know, they're mm -hmm. really having a go. And and if this isn't a success, and I'm sure the fact they're having a go, the next thing they do, and so. Just to be able to access, speak to those talented people, see what's happening, the latest things in the industry, you get such a, a good feel for things. Where when I was uh, an operator, especially in startup mode, I had the blinkers on. I was just mm -hmm. really, I wouldn't even know what was happening in the news because I was just so focused in operationally getting through day to day. And yeah. now it's a it's a different sort of like thirty thousand feet type view, uh, which is a bit different and and enjoyable. Mm -hmm. I'm going to flip it and ask what is the what is the worst thing but if but if worst doesn't quite sound uh that great maybe most challenging might be a little more apt I think so for us we don't take any management role any board positions any active involvement and we for us there's certain times you're like what the hell is happening here mm -hmm. just do this but you know I, that's not our thing they've got to run their own businesses it's but sometimes you feel like you want to take the reins and just say, mm -hmm. look, 
let's move quickly. This needs to be done. This and you you see some really bad um, operators. They're visionaries, but they're bad operators. You know, and that, and mm -hmm. they or they haven't got to be good operators. And th that 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 can be frustrating because they have the most amazing idea, and you're like, you need mm. like you need to I can focus. See the frustration, to by the these, way. <laughs> these people are, are on board, and and but everyone has different skill sets, and and mm -hmm. for us we're passive investors and that they hopefully will work it out and not every business is going to be a success, you know, so that's part of the learnings also. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's definitely fair to say that there are some, some real specialists out there in, in the day to day and they might not necessarily be able to envision what's happening in five to 10 years. And then you have some great executives who are the other way around who, who can tell you whether they'll shape the industry and, and, uh, but getting from A to B, is that they'll need a you know hopefully a good team around them to help them. Um, they used to always say at William Hill, which I never heard the term really. Oh, he's not an operator, or he's an operator, and <laughs> I, I, it was pretty broad brushstroke of like like. But there's some sense to it, you know. There's some people who yeah. can really drive a team and get people to work for them, and and there's other people that are that's not what they like doing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, final note for for me to end on. Um, what does the future hold for, for Tom Waterhouse? Uh, well, it's all about focus for us. You know, like we're just going to focus on, on one thing. You know, for the next 10, 20 years, just focus on the opera operator side of the gambling industry and, and just become real specialists in that area. And, um, uh, yeah, I, I feel we know it well. The team that I've been working with, I've been working with a long time, they're technical experts. They understand this part of the industry well, and and I love the industry. You know, I feel that uh, so um, so lucky and or very fortunate to have grown up in this industry because it's high growth. It's interesting. It's different. Most people don't go into it, um, but it's a well. It's been around since the beginning of the beginning of time, and and mm. I think people are going to be gambling and betting forever. So. I, I, it's 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 great to be in an industry that I enjoy, but also feel I have a have an edge in. Mm -hmm. Well, here here and uh, Tom, thank you very much for for your time for your answers. It's been been fascinating to walk through your your life and career, and and best of luck with with everything. As I say, uh, with all the focus in the next 10, 20 years. Thanks so much, Tim. Thank you. Thank you.